Before we get into what exactly is a concept, let's just go through how Vygotsky um, introduced preconceptual thought processes, how he came to uh, uncover them or describe them, and you were starting off with syncretic thinking. Yeah, um, the way, way I like to describe syncretic uh, thinking is like this. Just imagine yourself in a train in some foreign uh, city, uh, you're speeding out of the uh, station in the, the early hours of the morning, uh, everything's just flashing by and uh, you can't uh, pick out anything. You know what's going on, you know you're in a train in a foreign country and things, the general picture you know, but you can't pick out anything from the perceptual field. This is fr the basis from which conceptual thought has to start. And I put it this way because uh, this is not something unique to children. Uh, you could be sitting in that train and uh, that's the kind of world you would see. But as the countryside opens up a little bit, um, the light begins to clear, uh, you see something and you say, ah, or you know, baba or something. Uh, you haven't got a language yet, so you, you can't use a, a word, but you indicate it. You pick it out from its background in some way. And that's the beginning of conceptual thought, mm -hmm. where you've isolated something from its background uh, and you've made an attempt to name it. But of course, the, the thing's gone now. Uh, you have no way of remembering what you said. Uh, it's just uh, gone. Right? It's the way synthetic thought develops, as Vygotsky see it, it gets to a point where by you are able to uh, organize a, uh, a field spatially. And at the end point, really, you can say, uh, you can indicate that lot over there. You, know, you might see a farmhouse and a group of uh, uh, cypress trees on the horizon and you point to it and you say, you know, whatever, indicating them. Uh, th that's the, uh, the highest point of syncretic thought. And, and it's something that is going on uh, with us all the time. Uh, our, our thinking is, uh, is, is uh, within the flow of impressions. Okay? But it, with a child, that's all, they, all they've got to start with. Um, they're not able to abstract different uh, qualities or aspects or understand what they are perceiving at all. But they've begun to isolate things from their background. They have no control over the, the sequence of things that come up, just like when you're sitting in the train. It just one thing comes and then another and then another. So that's what uh, syncretic thought forms are. You, you can't in any sensible way call them uh, concepts, but at the same time they're the beginning of concepts. Uh, any uh, animal uh, experiences these things, but the, the, the human child differs from the most intelligent non-human animal in as much as the child will grow to become an adult and they'll be voting and paying their taxes. Uh, the most intelligent chimpanzee will never get there. So uh, the importance of syncretic thought forms for Vygotsky is that they are the starting point of concepts and in that sense they are concepts. Very good. Um, so then we move to the complexes, which is the next group of preconceptual thought processes. And in your book, um, you kind of separated, you said there were, but Vygotsky identified five complexes, and you separated them into different categories. Um, mm. You wrote, complexes go through a process of development in which Vygotsky identifies five different types, which do not neatly fall into phases because two parallel processes of development are at work, analysis and synthesis, and two mm. unifying factors, function and similarity. Um, and this yeah. is where I could use some help. You, you separated the first, mm. you, you kind of batched together associative complexes and collection complexes, and then also mm. next, chain complexes and diffuse concepts, complexes, mm. followed, by, mm. followed by pseudo complexes, uh, pseudo concepts. Mm. So if, if you don't mind in your, in your explanation of mm. this, can you also kind of tell me why you uh, grouped them that way? Well, the, the order in which they uh, appear in my book, in which you read them, um, is, is, is the way it shows me to explain them, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't really make a, a rational developmental series. Um, I would say the, the, the first thing in which Vygotsky takes first uh, after the syncretic concept has developed to a point where you have what he calls a heap, 
those over there, things that are gathered together uh, in with on no basis of no rationale really, uh, just gathered, but they are gathered together. So what we can see here is that the the, the beginnings of the ability to uh, form collectives, you know, to to gather things together. Um, now, what is lacking there is the ability to abstract. Right? So, uh, the, the most important thing of the development of complexes is the development of the ability to form uh, groups of things uh, and the, the ability to abstract uh, from them. Okay? So, this is synthesis and analysis. That, uh, capacities, psychological functions that are growing. So the chain complex appear, uh, you know, it appears very early in when the child can abstract some property from the perceptual field. What's involved in the chain complex is uh, in the different uh, things that the uh, child is able to isolate from their background, they have to also pick out some aspect, some attribute of what they see a colour, a shape, a movement or something. Uh, so they, they have to make this process of abstraction and then they have to uh, uh, hold in their mind, so to speak, uh, whatever it is they've picked out so that when they see something else, if they uh, see that something in common, then they uh, make that link. So it's that link from one thing to another based on uh, abstracting something that they see and finding it in common with the other thing. Okay, but then uh, the, the ability to do that isn't very stable. So they see the new thing mm. and they've made that link. They've said, oh, there's another bar bar. Of course, I just said bar bar or whatever. Uh, and they uh, pick out some other aspect of it. They can't hold on to what they abstracted from the one before. They, they, you know, they related it on colour, uh, but then they see something else that reminds them of the shape of the other one. So that's another bar bar. So the chain complex links a whole series of things based on the perceptual field, but each link is uh, the child uh, made the link with a different uh, attribute that's abstracted from the perceptual field. So you get a chain of things. Each link, A to B makes sense, B to me, C makes sense, but the connection from one to the other is not there. So C to, now, a, C to a doesn't necessarily make sense. That's right. right. Now. The, the next uh, development of this process, uh, it's a development of the, the strength of the, the, the psychological function involved in abstracting, whereby they're able to uh, keep the original, the first item that was perceived um, together as a kind of nucleus, so that each uh, thing that they associate with is associated back to this original object. So they see something that has particularly impressed them and they hold that object and, and they gather others together that remind them of it. Uh, but it's all around a central nucleus. But this is a step forward. because It means holding the, the impression of that first thing uh, for a period of time and through different experiences. And that's what Vygotsky called an associative complex. And just keeping up that thread, the diffuse complex works like this, where by in the associative complex, each time they brought a new uh, fellow into the family, it was uh, based still on a different uh, abstraction, uh, but abstracted from the same uh, original one, the center of it. Right? With a diffuse complex, they're making a step forward because they're also uh, associating with a, uh, a given, uh, you know, it might be the shape now or the movement of the thing. Uh, but it's somewhat diffuse. The, the ability to hold this uh, abstracted attribute is, uh, is none too stable. So that, that they, they associate a triangle with a trapezium instead of another triangle. But, you know, it's got sharp corners. Uh, and then they associate the trapezium with a square because it's sort of got the power opposite sides. And what this is like in, in adult life is when uh, people go beyond the, uh, the domain of their own experience. And, and for instance, racial prejudice is, is, is a diffuse complex because they uh, extrapolate from one experience to another 
uh, beyond their own experience. The old phrase of, oh, yeah, I like black people. All my, you know, I've got a lot of good friends, but these other ones that I've never met, they're terrible people. Okay, so that kind of thinking is a diffuse complex which is based on abstracting just one aspect of a thing but going beyond uh, personal experience. That's why, like when a child associates a trapezium with a triangle, uh, the, the ability to associate things correctly and rationally on the basis of, of an abstracted aspect uh, is unreliable, unstable and, and sort of de deceptive. Huh? Um, so all, all those things, series of complexes, are one, they're based on abstracting something from the perceptual field and f uh, which they can find in other things mm. um, and, the, and making a collection of it. So you see uh, the, uh, the growth of an ability to synthesize and form collectives alongside an ever more stable um, growth of the ability to abstract. Okay? So that's uh, the, the main things going on with uh, complexes. Okay? You've got uh, uh, the uh, psychological function involved in abstracting features from the perceptual field and then associating that with uh, similar or related features abstracted from a different perceptual field and forming a group based on that uh, likeness between things, a group based on likeness. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think when we talk about true concepts down the road, um, these complexes that you're talking about now, you could really see how this sets up the bigger picture. Because well, yeah, of course, true complex have, have really nothing to do with the perceptual field, that's the point. Right. But you can't operate, you can't know the hell what's going on other than through the perceptual field. So you have to be able to pick things out and, and see the different aspects uh, and be able to recognise things when you come across them before you have any chance of developing a concept. So we're still involved in building the psychological functions mm -hmm. which are preconditions to developing complex. Uh, it seems like it's 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 uh, a pathway toward learning how to abstract from away from that which is in front of you. And yeah. Now, one of the the other um, types of complex, which is a little bit distinct, is the uh, collection complex. Okay. okay. And what happens in the collection complex is uh, is really quite startling because. Um, the, it, when it's implemented in the, the famous blocks experiment, what the child does is pull together a series of things which make a collection because they're different. Now, th this looks really curious, but uh, I remember uh, hearing from my brother when his daughter was seeing everywhere uh, basically, you know, mummy thing, uh, daddy thing, and baby thing, right? That, that there's this uh, seeing, uh, gathering together things that made a complete set. So having dinner involves knife, fork, plate, cup, right? So th that's a collection, and it's a collection that is not based on likeness, but it's based on um, making a complete set. Mm. And very often, uh, the, f the foundation of that is actually practical life. It comes out in the uh, Bloch's experiment because <laughs> there's no practical life in that experiment. It's a laboratory experiment. But it, what it's modeling in the child's real life is how the child becomes able to associate different objects not by likeness but by their appearance uh, within some uh, occasion or, or system of activity. So for instance they might associate their, their various pets because they're all things that they have to feed and look after. They associate things that are involved with going to bed, they associate things that are involved in having to dinner. All the different things that are situations for them uh, associated through practical life uh, can form collections you know? and uh, of course uh, the, the, the well it, it's an important part of, uh, of development of concepts okay and the collection complex uh, is a particular type of uh, co you know, collective whereby uh, the it still depends on the abstraction of uh, features that make up a, a complete set. But underlying that is an ability to associate things uh, functionally uh, because they're associated with some 
a particular situation. Yeah. Okay. So, can we say that pseudo concepts are more developed versions of the complexes you talked about? Y yes, the the, the pseudo complex is still a complex, but its distinctive feature is it correctly uses a word from the adult language to pick out the things that belong to the, the complex. Um, so it doesn't so much rely on the child's impressions, right? though it, you know, like the fact that something is found on the dinner table and is blue, um, but of course it, the child has to have these psychological functions to pick out things that are associated with each other in practical life that have something in common with other things um, and to be able to name them before you can get to a pseudo complex, pseudo concept. So, what a pseudo concept does, it the child follows the, what adults call a name in it with a certain thing, and then they, they emulate that. So, uh, the the, um, the child and the adult are, are talking about the same things with the same word, but what the adult doesn't realise is that they have a concept of the thing. All the child has. Is a, is a concrete collection of objects which they know fall under this word. But they don't know that the, the social theory or the scientific theory or the religious theory behind that pseudo concept, which the uh, adult may have to guide them in bringing those things together. So the, the, the child doesn't really know uh, why the cross and, uh, and the statue of Mary um, are, are both icons to be treated with respect. Uh, but they, they follow what the adults are doing and, and that's reflected in their language, but they don't yet have the religious theory that associates Mary and the cross and Jesus and everything. But the child's able to pick up these things that are all associated with going to church and they may have features in common and so on. So that what the pseudo concept is doing is bringing together all the, the elementary uh, psychological functions that the child has had, which able, enables them to pick things out of the background, abstract from them uh, uh, different features, make collectives of them rationally on the basis of, of either their participation in some activity or their likeness, and then tag that up, not with a random word mm -hmm. that they've made up themselves, but a word they've correctly picked up from adult usage. And then that's a pseudo concept. And the thing I love about a pseudo concept, and of course, these are things that, that not only go on uh, and are used as in adult life, but overwhelmingly uh, every analytical uh, philosopher and psychologist you meet uh, knows only a pseudo concept. They have no concept of a true concept at all. Uh, and all the, the books that you uh, get in, in the psychology of concepts uh, only go so far as a pseudo concept. And the, they think, of course, these people, uh, philosophers, think in true concepts. I mean, it's absurd to think otherwise, uh, masterful conceptual thinkers. But when it comes to the question of what is a concept, overwhelmingly people, yeah, think, people think that it's uh, uh, concepts grouped together, things that share something uh, in common. And, and Wittgenstein, for instance, his big point was to show how it's not as easy as that, but it never occurred to him that a concept could be something other than a word that groups together things sharing something in common. Right? But um, that's what a pseudo-concept is, and it's not surprising if analytical philosophers and even famous ones can't tell the difference between that and a concept, that ordinary adults can't pick up the fact that their children um, mean something mm. different when they use the same word. What it comes out is uh, when a child will say something uh, sort of wrong, they'll make a faux pas, and they suddenly realize that, that they actually had a different conception uh, of the thing. Uh, you know, you thought all along that they understood it, but then they'll say, make some horrendous faux pas, and you realize that uh, it was very good acting, so to speak. They've, okay? ju they've just been using the words. That's right, and using them correctly. Right. Yeah? They knew everything that came under the heading of, of, of uh, ki kindly aunt, yeah? but they didn't <laughs> realize some of the things that went with kindly aunt, that you shouldn't tell her that you think she's got a funny nose or something, right? Well, they didn't fully understand the concept. Okay, so that's um, complexes, uh, and the, the supreme uh, concept is the, sh the so the supreme complex is the pseudo concept. But what is often overlooked is the potential concept, mm. and this sort of slips quietly by in uh, reading of Vygotsky. But the stunning thing about a potential concept 
is that for Vygotsky, it's, a, it's not only pre, a pre-conceptual form, it's a pre-intellectual form. Animals uh, know uh, potential concepts. A trained pigeon that responds correctly to the red button to get a, 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 you know, a serving of, uh, of, of seed from the machine or something has formed a potential concept. A potential concept is uh, it's not based on likeness or the isolation of specific perceptual features. It's a characterization of a whole situation uh, and an understanding of, of, of it uh, as a whole uh, and the formation of habits around that. Okay? Now, for instance, the trained pigeon responds correctly to the red button uh, when it wants some food, but if you put it in a different circumstance, it may not recognize that red button. Right? It's only the whole situation. So it's not about isolating uh, features. It's about forming a habit uh, around specific things. And um, potential concepts particularly uh, can be very powerful. If a child, for instance, is brought up with a father that likes pulling motor cars, uh, to bits. They will have a very sophisticated understanding of, of uh, what's a carburetor and you know, what's a, a set of points or whatever. They don't think they have them anymore, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's not just based on uh, recognizing likeness. It's based on uh, uh, understanding how they form part of that whole practical activity. Uh, but the, the thing is it's absolutely unconscious. Right? It's unconscious. It's not I say unconscious. The, the child is not aware of it as a concept. Right? They, uh, and, and take it out of that practical situation uh, and they, 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 have, they lose that uh, concept altogether. The potential concept um, is very powerful because it's a basis for practical activity. It's not just based on likeness. Uh, it'll be based on a system, but only a system within a very specific uh, practical situation. And, and, and it's uh, the development of the potential concept um, goes alongside the development of complexes, which are based on likeness. Okay, and and uh, you combine that with the, the developing ability of the child to follow the adult language, and we have coming together some powerful abilities uh, towards developing conceptual thought. Okay, but one of the things to notice about this is that because you're looking at the development of the ability to isolate things from the background preconditioned to everything, the ability to abstract different features from the perceptual field, the ability to, to form collectives uh, of uh, different things, whatever they are, the ability to uh, relate things to practical activity and their place in uh, some system of uh, activity, uh, their functional aspects. All these functions are developing side by side. So you're unlikely to get a nice, neat series of, of you know, levels one, two, three, four. Right? Um, because uh, the, while you see this in the development of the complex, uh, there are other uh, factors that are developing. For instance, the child may develop a very uh, well-refined uh, ability to abstract, but the, the ability to, to pull things together into collectives may be at a different stage. And now the, the, the final uh, one of these um, preconceptual uh, forms of activity that um, uh, Vygotsky points to is the preconcept. Now, this confused me for a long time because I presumed that preconcept meant all those things before concepts, but okay. it doesn't mean that at all. He's referring to a specific um, type of preconceptual form, which uh, is what a child is doing when they learn uh, numbers or when they learn the rules of a game, these are, um, are, are, are abstractions, right? Um, but they're not, uh, can you put it? They're, they're, they're relatively abstract. They're, like if you think of, of numbers as an example, to abstract a number um, and to, to hold a number as a thing itself, as opposed to looking at a row of things and saying there's six there, okay. But to hold that idea of six, that's a preconcept. But it's still very uh, limited because it, it's, uh, it's not yet something of the world. You know? it, it, it's just uh, something that you can operate within uh, a specific context, such as counting things or buying and selling, uh, knowing the value of money and how many goes to what. 
within a very defined system of relations, a finite system of relations, children can be quite brilliant in, uh, in becoming virtuosos and operating these abstract relations. Uh, but these are not yet true concepts either. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I often think you have a, you know, your eight-year-old chess grandmaster uh, and you whip your pants uh, at a game of chess and, and some Vygotsky said to you, yeah, but this child isn't yet capable of conceptual thought. This seems an outrage. Mm -hmm. you know, the child's brilliant. Uh, look at that you know, subtle strategic move he's making to isolate my knight or whatever. Um, but the thing is that that's uh, a, a facility with abstraction and, and strategic reasoning and logical thinking uh, developed within a finite, a limited set of relations. Okay? And children can do that. So at that age, you know, when they're probably going to school, if they're in a country where schooling goes on and they're, they're uh, learning abstract uh, subjects, so they're, they're, uh, their abstract reasoning skills are being developed, but they're not yet at the stage of forming true concepts. Mm -hmm. so, so even that child, genius chess player, is not working in true concepts? Well, of course, he might be, but not on the basis. You can't say it's on the basis of him being a good chess player. I wonder about child soldiers sometimes. A child soldier who's really a child that should be at home being looked after by its parents, but it's out there, you know, uh, dealing with the affairs of the nation. Now, that's a pathology. Right? We all recognize that child, uh, child soldiers is a, are a pathology. Uh, and so what you have there is, is a is uh, a forced development of concepts but it, it's um what can you put it it's corrupted it's it's sick and and, and it has to be dealt with but but so the child within the context of playing chess within the context context of his expertise can he be working with true concepts there even though he doesn't have great world, um, worldly no, experience no not working there look the, the, the a computer can beat you at chess a computer knows nothing of concepts all it does is a series of logical operations, nothing to do with conceptual thought. I, I know we're, we're playing a bit of a, of a mystery game here, I know, but because we haven't talked about what concepts are. But I say if a computer can do it, it's not conceptual. Right? And, and <laughs> computers play a very good game of chess, and so can bright young kids. Right? Can you very just quickly um, explain why potential concepts and pre-concepts are kind of hanging in between pseudo-concepts and true concepts? Like, why are they not concepts yet? Well, potential concepts, as I said, are actually uh, pre-intellectual. Okay. Uh, th th these are not uh, based on uh, the abilities that are developed through um, uh, c development of complexes, isolating of separate uh, abstra uh, features of something, right? So the uh, pigeon that will peck a red button in order to get food doesn't know about red, doesn't know about buttons, right? It, it, it's just doing its thing. Uh, it develops a habit, and the habit requires a whole situation to elicit it. Right? Now, that uh, habit, that training, is what is called a potential concept. It's, it's not an intellectual thing. Right? But if, the, if you were to become aware of that, right, uh, th then you have the basis for turning that potential concept into a concept, but, but that requires you become aware of it and you become aware of its place in the world. So very sophisticated forms of, of, of action uh, are, are possible on the basis of potential concepts, but they're just like conditioned reflexes. Right? They're very highly developed conditioned reflexes, but they're, they're found uh, in animals. Pre-concept is, is, is different. I mean, it really is verging uh, on conceptual thought, but it doesn't make it because uh, it only exists within um, a very finite set of relations. Like uh, a child can learn the rules of a game, but th they don't really, not in a position to, uh, to critique those rules. Right? Uh, they can like or dislike or play the game more or less well, right? but it's just that finite set of rules that they, they, they're able to learn. It's this uh, finiteness and closeness of the, of the, the world of various uh, games and, and activities like counting and, and uh, giving change and, and so on, measuring, um, which, which 
makes it possible for the child to enter into these and, and develop the acquired skills. So they're not yet at concepts. Okay, can you walk us through a little bit of uh, your conclusions? Um, I'm kind of basing this off of the chapter that you wrote on preconceptual thinking. Yeah, look, to sum up, what we'll do is, in doing, it, in doing an experiment, Vygotsky uh, isolates different forms of activity. Right? And from these activities, you can characterize them in terms of being this or that type of concept. That's what the experiment can do to you. But what lies behind this is the development of certain psychological functions. And, and what I'll do is just go through and list these psychological functions. We, this is not, Vygotsky doesn't do this. These are mentioned incidentally as he's going through. But the first one, uh, which is what comes out in syn syncretic uh, action, is that simply the ability to isolate something from its background and to, to pick it out in some way by, for instance, naming it. Right? Um, that's the, the starting point for conceptual thought. Secondly is the ability to isolate or abstract from a concrete object or situation a single perceptual feature so that you can use that to recognize the, an object or situation later to relate to the first one. But you have to abstract something from that perceptual field. Next is the ability to synthesize diverse objects into collections or diffuse groupings, sharing something in common. Could be uh, an attribute or it could be participation in the same uh, functional relation. Right? Okay. Um, and the ability to add new members to a, a, a such a concrete grouping. Uh, the next is the ability to represent to yourself uh, functional sets of objects and to be able to isolate individual objects according to functional significance. So, for instance, when you go to the dinner table, you learn that you ought to find, uh, I mean, I'm, this is a parody in a way, but you ought to find a, a knife, a fork, and a plate in front of you, and you know what to do with them, and you know they go together. Right? It might be chopsticks in a bowl, that's not the point. Right? But it's the ability to recognize that as a set, and if the knife wasn't there, say, where's the knife? Yeah? And, and, and it's not that you uh, have picked out specific uh, features of them, right? But you, you, it's like with a shadow board. If there's, if there's a, you know what a shadow board is? Men have them in their, in their sheds where you hang your tools up. And, okay. and if a tool's missing, there's, there's, a, there's a painted shape of it behind you. So you immediately know the hammer's missing because you can see the green hammer uh, where the hammer should be, you know, the painted one. Well, it, in that, it, I've never heard of that. I wonder, I wonder if you're dating yourself there, but it sounds like a good <laughs> idea. Well, I am probably. I think <laughs> sheds are a thing of the past nowadays, aren't they? I do they? have a shed. But, yeah. <laughs> well, men used to do woodwork in their sheds, you see. It still goes on, actually. <laughs> and uh, Vonnie's telling me uh, that her dad used to, my grandfather used to. And you have these, uh, all your, you hang your tools up, you see. And when one's missing, you can see immediately it's missing. So a child has to have that kind of ability to, to know what's missing from a set and be able to find it. But it's not really, they're not uniting these things by a perceptual feature. They're not abstracting the feature from the thing. They're not, they don't know what a hammer shape is as such, right? But they know it when they see it, so to speak, because it's the missing part from a functional set of things. Mm -hmm. Finally is the ability to use adult words, words from the adult language, to do that isolation. And this is where a child, for instance, is said to command themselves. When the adults tell them to do something, like, you know, Johnny, go to bed now. And little Johnny at a certain point will say, have to go to bed now. Right? And they're, they're picking up the adult words to apply them to themselves. So this is an ability which is very far reaching, is the ability to correctly use uh, words from the adult language to control their own behavior, such as picking out the right set of objects. Uh, and then uh, lastly, or almost lastly, I've got the ability to develop an habitual response to objects or situations connected to their practical significance for the child. Okay? So that's the basis of a potential concept. Right? So in order to be able to operate practically within the child's environment, uh, they, they have to be able to recognize the objects and, and the use of them uh, within that situation. And that, that is certainly one of the preconditions developing a concept and that ability exhibited on its own is called a, uh, a potential concept. 
And finally, I've got uh, the ability to carry out reasoning operations within a finite system of relations in which preconcepts implicit in operations such as counting and calculating are formed. Okay, so uh, th th this ability to reason, uh, I think the consensus is that this requires um, argument and disagreement and that kind of social interaction which corrects mistakes. Uh, I'm not a teacher, but uh, that's a typical way. So the child learns to play chess. Uh, the, they begin by being told and corrected when they make the right move or wrong move, and then they succeed or fail in a different strategic. And they learn that system of relations, which uh, is building up a pre-concept. It looks very much like a concept. What's specific and limited about it is only that it's really it's a home thing. Right? It only happens on the chessboard mm. um, you know if it doesn't go beyond that that finite universe of, of the chessboard just the same as counting doesn't go beyond that very finite universe of numbers okay so th th there are the seven different abilities which are manifested in all the different preconceptual forms that uh, Vygotsky outlines and and the Vygotsky spends probably more time uh, on outlining these preconceptual forms uh, than he does talking about concepts as such, probably. Uh, and that leads to some confusion. Uh, I believe Sakharov himself, his uh, student who uh, assisted in designing this uh, famous blocks experiment, from his writing it appears that, that, that uh, Sakharov uh, didn't really know the difference between um, a, a pseudo-concept and a true concept. Um, I mean, he, he died a long time ago now, that seems unfair, he made a brilliant contribution. But it's, it's very widespread, and, and, but it's um, a conception that we, uh, we need to deal with. What we're dealing with, with these uh, complexes and potential concepts, is the development of the psychological functions, which are preconditions to operating uh, as an independent person out there in the in, in social world, dealing with ideology, professional responsibilities, raising your own family and so on. You need certain psychological functions before you can even make a beginning on that. When you go out into the world, uh, the big wide world, where no one's there to hold your hand and anyone's there likely to knock your head off, uh, you, you begin to, to, to learn a different much broader, more powerful kind of thinking, which entails inheriting and making use of the knowledge of, of all the past generations. Wow. That's really well said. And I look forward to uh, picking up, if we do this again, um, talking a little bit more about true concepts, now that we yeah. kind of have the, the background. Um, but as, as you know, um, I have a daughter who's like right on the verge of just starting to talk. And right. Like any day now. I mean, she, yeah. you know, she says mama, dada, but you know, you help me clarify a lot of these issues, and it's just a really interesting time to be studying this and watching her and you know conduct all these little mini experiments in my head. It's just yeah. it's great. So yeah. it's very it's a it's, uh, you know on, a, on an intellectual level, on a personal level, it's all very relevant and real to me. Yeah, because yeah, so one of the principles that underlies Vygotsky's work here is the old sort of adage that in order to understand something, you have to uh, not only see it come into being, but actually participate in mm. the formation of it. Yeah? And that's a privilege you have as a parent to go through that and really understand yeah. what makes a person. It's good. Absolutely. So I guess we'll do this okay. again. We'll do it again. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.